Hey guys, Tyler here. The Vulcans are, of course, one of the most widely recognized alien species from Star Trek. A warp-capable humanoid species from a planet of the same name, Vulcans are a founding member of the United Federation of Planets and are widely represented throughout Starfleet. Known for their strict adherence to logic as well as their stoic personalities, Vulcans largely resemble humans save for their pointed ears, slanted eyebrows, and preposterous haircuts. But in fact, they have a lot of other biological distinctions from humans as well, especially internally. I made a video a while back about early Vulcan history and culture, especially the influence of Surak, and how the Vulcans may be descended from ancient astronauts who lived over half a million years ago, the Aretians, introduced in the original series episode, Return to Tomorrow. But in this video, I'd like to focus on their contemporary physiology, as well as how their environment has impacted their evolution. Let's get started. As far as their appearance, we see that Vulcan skin color ranges from a common pale with a bronze or greenish tint to darker complexions, not unlike the skin tone range of humans. Most Vulcans have naturally straight, glossy black hair, but brown and curly hairstyles are not uncommon, and indeed some Vulcans even grow beards. The Vulcans' pointed ear shape and their more sensitive hearing overall are also the most logical outcomes of evolving on an arid homeworld with a relatively thin atmosphere, as sound waves would propagate more slowly and thus more weakly. Their ears would therefore be contoured to capture sound more efficiently. This may also be the reason why Vulcan females' sense of smell is so strong, as like sound, odors would have more difficulty traveling through a thinner atmosphere. Vulcans are most comfortable in high temperatures, owing once again to their planet's warm climate. It makes sense then that their respiratory system is highly efficient at extracting oxygen, and Vulcan's predominantly desert environment also reportedly led to the evolution of the Vulcan inner eyelid to better block dust and other particulates. Continuing with their internal anatomy, a Vulcan's heart is located where a human's liver would normally be. Vulcans have no appendix, but they do have mitochondria, indicating that, like in humans, this prokaryotic single-celled organelle being the powerhouse of the cell fused together with the eukaryotic cells of Vulcan's distant ancestors. Vulcan blood is copper-based and medium green when oxygenated, hence the reason for pale-skinned Vulcan's olive complexion. Indeed, some Earth life uses copper instead of iron to bind oxygen within their blood, such as horseshoe crabs, though their blood appears blue. Whereas these arthropods' blood uses a different protein, hemocyanin, rather than hemoglobin, Vulcan blood is explicitly said to use hemoglobin as well. The Vulcan digestive tract is highly adaptable to a variety of alien foods, quite noteworthy in a galaxy with so much biological diversity. Vulcans have a superior metabolism to humans, with caffeine and other stimulants having little to no effect on them. They are capable of surviving long durations without food or sleep. Under stress, a Vulcan can go without sleep for weeks. Vulcans are on average three times stronger than humans and have faster reflexes, such as when they need to subdue a person with their notorious nerve pinch. And they typically have a lifespan of over 200 years. Okay, I've referenced the Vulcan homeworld quite a bit thus far, but what else do we really know about it? Well, Vulcan is the second planet in the 40 Aridini system, a real star system 16 light years away, consisting of a K-type orange dwarf primary and white and red dwarf companions. These companions, 40 Aridini B and C respectively, orbit far enough away, 400 astronomical units on average, that they wouldn't significantly affect planets orbiting 40 Aridini A, also known as Kide. K-type orange stars like Kide, which are generally smaller, cooler, and slightly longer lived than our sun, emit less light in the blue, energy-rich portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Thus, many astronomers have considered them optimal for harboring extraterrestrial life 
due to this calm radiation environment. However, there is growing evidence that K-type stars emit dangerously high levels of X-rays and far ultraviolet radiation longer into their main sequence phase than G and M-type stars. This prolonged saturation period may have a sterilizing effect, destroying atmospheres or at least delaying the emergence of complex life in K-type stars' habitable zones. That said, 40 Aridini is approximately 5.6 billion years old. Even though it's considered a flare star, if the primary emitted sterilizing radiation for over a billion years after its formation, this would have subsided by the time the ancient humanoids first visited the system. Of course, in some non-canon novels, Vulcan was previously a lush tropical planet whose surface was scorched by a solar flare, forcing early life to adapt or die. This is also likely the reason that Vulcans can tolerate higher levels of radiation. Vulcans orbit around Kide is about 60% the distance that Earth orbits the Sun, the same radius as most K-type stars' habitable zones. While its day length is stated to be 24 hours, its orbital period would be under two-thirds of one Earth year according to Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Vulcan is stated in some production sources to have seasons induced either by axial tilt or eccentricity, which cause Vulcan's sky to shift between red in the summer and blue in the winter. An observer standing on Vulcan's surface would see their sun appear 20% wider in diameter than our sun looks to us, as per an equation that governs relative height to distance and an object's actual size. Kide's white and red dwarf companions would appear as unusually bright stars in the night sky, slightly brighter than the appearance of Venus on Earth in the evening. Vulcan's surface gravity is stated in various sources to be 1.4 g, which would have encouraged them to develop stronger muscles to overcome this additional gravitational force perfectly in line with Vulcan's increased strength as seen throughout Star Trek. Shifting gears back to Vulcan's physiology, one of the most intriguing characteristics is their brain. Brain and brain! What is brain? As many tend to forget, Vulcans are not unemotional. In fact, it's said that their emotions are stronger than humans. They just suppress them. They even have a part of their brain dedicated to suppressing emotions in the mesiofrontal cortex. Vulcans can sense strong emotions in others, qualifying them as empaths, much like Betazoids. Though they're not as naturally advanced, being unable to read minds per se. Traumatic experiences are not only psychologically damaging to Vulcans, but have physical consequences as well. An example of epigenetics, environmentally influenced gene expression, or phenotypical alterations. The Vulcan brain is even capable of lobotomizing itself as it reorders neural pathways. Vulcans can, however, learn to gain conscious control of many of these functions, allowing them to highly regulate their body through sheer willpower. When injured, Vulcans can enter a trance-like state and focus all of their mental energy on healing themselves. Given the power of the placebo effect and evidence that meditating can have positive neurological effects, this isn't too out of the ordinary. Of course, Vulcans naturally have some levels of pain that they cannot suppress, forcing them to endure the experience. Famously, the Vulcans are a telepathic species, though they're not as evolved as, say, the Cairn to the point of no longer needing vocal cords. They are capable of performing mind melds through touch, among a variety of other related abilities. Considerable training is required to hone this skill, but recipients do not require any concentration, training, or even conscious knowledge of the act, although it, it is customary for Vulcans to, you know, ask permission before initiating a meld. These mind melds allow for the exchange of 
thoughts, memories, and sensations, in essence allowing the participants to become one mind, a sort of shared gestalt consciousness. Vulcans are often erroneously considered touch telepaths by outsiders. However, while physical contact is not strictly required, it does enhance the effectiveness of a mind meld. This is likely because the electrochemical processes that presumably occur during a mind meld are easier to induce when the initiator and the recipient are in very close proximity, as the electric signals don't have to take as long to propagate. When performing the act, the initiator places the tips of their fingers at key points on the recipient's head. A mind meld can be used to probe another person's mind, or even transfer an individual's entire personality or soul, known to Vulcans as the Katra, into another body. This serves as an indication that in Star Trek, consciousness can in fact exist independently of the body, something that is still uncertain according to modern medical science. The exact source of Vulcan telepathy is unknown to outsiders. However, the underlying power may be associated with the concept of Quilari, a focal point in the bioelectric field of the Vulcan brain. In the TOS episode The Immunity Syndrome, Spock tells Dr. McCoy that he felt the combined shock and terror of the minds of 400 of his fellow Vulcans aboard the all-Vulcan crewed USS Intrepid as they suddenly died. The sister Constitution class starship was at the time at least one sector away, meaning at least 20 light years. This, and not only the incident is interesting as it suggests Vulcan telepathy is able to transit through subspace by virtue of the fact that Spock's awareness of the tragedy appears to have happened faster than light. Truly even stronger, well-trained Vulcan minds are capable of non-contact telepathic projection and scanning, usually over short distances but sometimes over light years of interstellar space. When a strong Kotrick bond between the communicating individuals has been pre-established, again strongly suggesting a subspace component to their communications. Vulcans can also engage in telepathic suggestion or compulsion whether consciously or unconsciously. Mind melds do carry some risks. They can be physically debilitating for both parties and can potentially aggravate pre-existing conditions through pressure changes. The act of melding itself results in a partial loss of identity and self-awareness and can be difficult to break. Another side effect is the transfer of emotion, such as when Spock melded with James T. Kirk in the 2009 Star Trek film. After effects of mind meld can often be treated with drugs. An improperly trained melder can cause a recipient to develop a degenerative neurological disorder called Pinar syndrome, fatal if left untreated. 22nd century Vulcan medicine does not have a cure for Pinar syndrome, but the disorder and its cure were known as far back as Surak's time, the 4th century AD. It's likely the loss of the cure over millennia was the result of festering prejudice against melders, though the cure itself a corrective meld performed by an experienced melder is eventually rediscovered, and by the 24th century, the fact that the Katra can be transferred between individuals and Katric arcs, arguably a form of mind uploading, is a commonly accepted medical practice. This is huge, considering that in real life, while it's likely an emergent property of our brain's lengthy evolution, what truly forms the basis of consciousness is still an ongoing scientific debate. Approximately every seven years, adult Vulcans undergo Pon Far, the Vulcan mating period. It is marked by intense emotions and primal urges, also referred to as a blood fever, that can kill a Vulcan if they are not satisfied. Symptoms include fever and elevated dopamine levels. Like Betazoids, Vulcans can create a telepathic mating bond, even with non-Vulcans. Similar to what we discussed earlier, this mating bond is observed to transfer the behavioral effects of Ponfar to both Vulcans and non-Vulcans across even moderate distances. Interestingly, a Vulcan's first Ponfar can occur at any point throughout their life. For example, to 
Paul's first Ponfar occurs when she is 65 years old, albeit by accident, whereas Spock experiences a Ponfar when he is much younger. As far as reproducing with other species, it was believed that Vulcans and humans could barely reproduce even with medical intervention as of the 2150s. However, further genetic research revealed many ways that various species could interbreed successfully. Ultimately, in the mid-23rd century, Spock becomes the first known human-Vulcan hybrid to survive into adulthood. Many Vulcan traits are dominant in human-Vulcan hybrids, including Vulcan's pointed ears, their green blood, and full range of physical and mental abilities. For more on the, let's say, biomechanics of interspecies reproduction, I happen to have a whole video about that. Link in the description. So, I've covered quite a bit in today's video. I discussed Vulcan's external differences and similarities to humans, as well as their internal anatomy, including the unique properties of their brain. I think it's important to consider the place the Katra has in Vulcan biology, history, and culture sets them apart from lots of other aliens throughout Star Trek. And it's most certainly a relic of their ancient past, particularly the alleged colonization of their planet by the Aretians, who themselves were able to transfer their consciousnesses into artificial receptacles. Speaking of which, how many of Vulcan's traits do you think naturally evolved on their homeworld? versus being introduced artificially by the Aretians? Or do you think that the Vulcans are seeded direct descendants of the Aretians themselves? Furthermore, if you are a starship captain, would you recruit a Vulcan to serve on your crew? Why or why not? Let me know down below. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper.